so much for the history. Uh, let us now discuss the most common argument against the denial of free will. A form of this argument was known already to the later Greeks, uh, and indeed Alexander of Aphrodisias himself uses it. It is known as the lazy argument, argos logos, in ancient Greek. This argument, in modern free will terms, runs as follows. If everything is predetermined and we don't have free will, why should we bother to do anything at all? We could spend our lives in sloth and laziness, hence the name of the argument. For example, if I am destined to win an athletic trophy, then I will win it regardless of whether I train or not, and therefore I don't need to train. Similarly, if I am destined not to win the trophy, then no training in the world will make me win it, and so, again, I don't need to train. This same argument is often used even today by those who don't know much philosophy, and therefore don't know that the argument was answered over two millennia ago. Uh, the answer, um, to a form of this argument anyway, um, is found in various philosophers, and most notably in the Stoic philosopher Chrysippus. Since the concept of free will didn't yet exist, Chrysippus answered it in a deterministic rather than free will context, but the logic of the answer is the same. So, uh, this answer, uh, which gets a little bit technical, uh, is that there is no contradiction between reflecting on a course of action and at the same time realizing that what one ultimately decides will not stem from a metaphysically free choice. Even if uh, an outcome is determined, the effort that leads to it is concomitantly determined. That is to say, those who employ the lazy argument in favor of free will erroneously place the goal action, winning the trophy, in a category that is different from the category of the actions that surround the goal action, such as training, dieting, concentrating mentally on the goal, and so on. But that separate categorization is an illusion, and in fact all actions are in the same category. To this answer we can add that by placing the surrounding actions in a different category, the proponents of the lazy argument assume that those actions, like training and dieting and so on, uh, are up to us. That is to say, they assume in the premise that which they wish to prove, namely that action is free and up to us. And so their error of categorization is also an error of circularity. Uh, not only our efforts are concomitantly determined with our goal, uh, but also reward or punishment is determined along with the action that is rewarded or punished. Uh, and so uh, the fact that there is no free will has no bearing whatsoever on the issue of responsibility for our actions. Uh, now, some more politically uh, motivated deniers of free will uh, tend to believe in a Marxist spirit that impersonal social forces remove people's agency and responsibility, which is why they begin to defend criminality and generally low standards as the legitimate outcome of such forces. And they thereby dehumanize humanity. This is completely wrong. We must understand, with the earlier Greeks, that the larger social, historical, and physical forces that are constantly at work upon us uh, must never be allowed to remove agency and responsibility uh, from human beings. Uh, this means that humans are not to be viewed through the lens of incompatibilism, uh, which holds that determinism and responsibility, uh, or free will, are incompatible, as opposed to compatibilism. But one must distinguish here between antiquity and modern times. Ancient compatibilism considers determinism to be compatible with responsibility, while modern compatibilism considers determinism to be compatible with free will, not merely responsibility, since by modern times there is a clear notion of free will. Ancient compatibilism is correct. Responsibility is a must with or without externally determined action, but modern compatibilism is a waste of breath. The mere fact that philosophers have striven to uphold modern compatibilism presupposes, incorrectly, that there is a necessary connection between responsibility and free will, that these two, responsibility and free will, must in some way or other go together. Uh, they therefore talk of a problem of free will. This attitude demonstrates the extent to which Christian theology has influenced our thinking, because why should it be a problem? It can only be a problem when we assume that there must be a natural link between responsibility and free will, with the result that responsibility disappears if free will disappears. But there's no ground for this assumption. In fact, we should not view human beings as responsible for their actions metaphysically, because of free choice, but physically, because they are the physical space from which an action emanates. Now, as it happens, the Greeks had an expression for this. Something is not done by us, but rather dihemon, through us. 
If one were to interject that denying free will and still holding people responsible for their actions would render the world unjust, there is a twofold reply. First, again, why must the world be just? It is precisely the Judeo-Christian conviction that an omniscient, omnipotent, transcendent, self-aware and benevolent force rules everything that leads to the necessity of a just world, and thus to the philosophical branch of theodicy, the justice of God, or why bad things happen to good people. If we do not believe in such a God, there is no need to hold on to cosmic justice. Uh, by understanding that the world is not especially just, we also come to understand the futility of so-called social justice, the foolish and tyrannical effort to perfect society. Second, the mere assumption that just desserts depend on the freedom of the agent is Christian or proto-Christian. Why do we assume that responsibility must have this dependence on freedom? But for God, there is absolutely no ground for this assumption. Anyone who does not understand that cannot understand pre-Christian antiquity, uh, the era of the greatest philosophy that the world has yet produced. Uh, the desperate effort to defend metaphysical freedom is based uh, on an equally desperate effort to view our world as essentially metaphysically just. But the world is not particularly just. It simply is. In the modern era, Kant threw out much of the faith and trappings of religion and thought his conclusions based on reason, while in fact he did preserve a great deal of what is important about Christianity, such as its moral underpinnings, so that uh, uneducated secularists could come to believe that they are beyond Christianity and thus arrogantly array themselves against religious people. Uh, these secularists pride themselves on quote-unquote rationally rejecting religion, but they unwittingly preserve in their thought and mentality much of what is at its core religious metaphysics. They have merely replaced one metaphysical belief, God, with another, free will. Uh, but they still have the goal to criticize the supposed irrationality of religious people. The fact that we do not have free will is not only not a problem, but it can in fact be seen as a good thing. If we acknowledge that we exercise far less deliberate control over our actions than most people believe, uh, we tend to become less judgmental of other people. Uh, we certainly do not take the radical leftist or Marxist route in believing that the lack of free will excuses criminals in any way. Uh, but when we inflict punishment for the crime, as of course we must in order for society to function, uh, then we do so without hatred or fury, but simply because it is necessary to stop the criminal and to offer a future deterrent. Uh, so too, when someone wrongs me, I never hate the person, and even though as a practical matter I might have to take some action against the wrongdoing, uh, I do so without anger, which is also a lot healthier for me, personally. Um, that is to say that ethics becomes more pragmatic and less judgmental, uh, if we uh, recognize the lack of free will. Um, so we stop hating the criminal and evildoers uh, because of their lack of free will, uh, and we thus become able to elevate ourselves above resentment, and we appreciate things for what they are, whether they chose to be what they are or not. When we look back in history at the bravery and sacrifice of those who fought and died for freedom, their bravery and sacrifice were not lessened by the fact that they did not choose to be brave and that they did not freely choose to fight. Just as the rose is no less beautiful simply because it didn't will its own beauty and wondrous fragrance into existence. So free will is irrelevant to the question of good and bad action and to the distinction between nobility and turpitude. So even though we reject the theological underpinnings of free will that conservatives tend to hold, if I may now politicize the whole thing for a moment, uh, we also reject the notion of many leftists who often seek to excuse criminal behavior by pointing to the larger forces that control us. The conflict between these two sides is solved once we realize that moral responsibility is not tied to free will, as I have tried to explain. And so, as very often, we can solve a modern conundrum by looking back at ancient and specifically Greek times. So, I hope you have gained something from uh, this discussion of free will. If you wish to share your thoughts and discuss the topic with me, I would very much look forward to reading your comments below. And if you enjoy little philosophy videos like this, feel free to like and or subscribe. Again, I'm Benedict Beckelt, and thank you so much for watching.